So once again, welcome. And uh, my disclaimer that uh, the views expressed are not Chabad of Arizona or Smile on Seniors. They are mine and mine alone. <clears throat> and slide number two. Hopefully we'll have a very lively discussion on the Grizzlies. Um, I found some very interesting twists and analogies in the movie, which we'll, we'll discuss at the end. Before I start, please make note of the date of the next discussion group. It will be May the 20th, which is a Thursday at 11 o'clock because the Tuesday is Shavuot. <clears throat> so make a note of that date. It is not going to be the Tuesday, it will be the Thursday. And the movies I'm going to suggest, um, there are two movies on Netflix, two outstanding movies that have just come on. The Pianist, which was an Oscar-winning movie in 2002, and The Zookeeper's Wife, which previous, previously was restricted and you had to pay for it. It's now free and available. And our discussion will be on Menasha, Menasha and Stiesel. And for that date, we have a guest, uh, the Rebetzin Rivki Slonen, Slonen which, who is uh, Rabbi Levy's mother-in-law, who will discuss the movies, as well as any questions you or we have about the movie, about the sect, and about why they do things in certain ways. I know I have questions, so make a list of yours and either hold on to them or forward them to me, and I will compile them. Um, so these are the two movies that we are going to highlight for next session. So now let's get on to the trailer. It's a bad scene for a lot of the kids up here, eh? What's being done? You lived up here a long time? 6,000 years. Welcome to the edge of the world. We have 21 students in your class. Miranda Atatahak. Shani Ignat Palga. Sorry. <laughs> Jason Midovic. He's not coming back. Another night out with the call. I put the word to my neck is on froze. My team really winning, get hit it, get with it. No limit when I get back under the road. No These kids, they need an outlet to get involved in something besides this damn night culture. Sports. Who the hell are you to say what we need? <laughs> Hey bud, you wanna come check out lacrosse Wednesday after school? Flyers won't work. You gotta show respect, eh? You guys like sports, huh? I don't like to run. Come on guys, let's turn down the suck and turn up the good. Now are you with me? Yeah! Um, you got a bit of a problem? They don't want me going to a white man's school. He has to hunt. His family is starving. We don't need to defend our way of life to a southerner. Family comes first, not school, not some white man's game. You don't want them reaching for something that they care about? There's a cost for reaching. Haven't you figured out yet that I don't know what the hell I'm doing? This is not about you. All of us have made sacrifices to be here. We've been dealing with this stuff for years and we're still here. Instead of drinking or fighting, we are proud, strong, full of hope. Who are we? Are you in a hurry? Do you, do you need a ride? Oh, no, no, thanks. I'm just running. From, from what? <clears throat> okay, so it may sound like we're scraping the bottom of the barrel with sports movies. If we're now showcasing lacrosse. However, in the case of the Grizzlies, our barrel runneth over. Like any good inspirational athletic adventure, the film foregoes a strong connection with the human side of the story. 
There is a fervent, fiery, emotional drive propelling this true life tale of a teacher who inspired his underdog students to take up their sticks, overcome unrelenting sorrow, and unite an unsung community. The film, which premiered at the 2018 Toronto Film Festival, saw its March 20th US release date delayed due to the coronavirus, which is a shame since it's exactly the type of uplifting movie that could boost the spirits during these bleak, bleak times. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Yes, the, Grizzly is, the Grizzlies is based on a true story. It showcases the real life account of a town called Kugluktuk, and excuse my pronunciations, located in the Kitamiyot region of Nunavut, Canada. The community used to be known for its insanely high teen suicide rates back in the early 20, uh, 2000s. A considerable portion of the kids were deprived of proper education and the mere feat of getting through high school qualified as something remarkable. But once the Grizzlies program ran its course, things changed. It all started with the town community discovering an affinity for the sport of lacrosse, particularly stemming from the perpetual desperation of the teens. The connecting bridge turned out to be a teacher, Russ Shepard, who gave them lessons on the sport for a period of seven years, 1998 to 2005. This gradually helped them regain their lost purpose. Before long, the suicide rate plummeted to zero. The despair of the Inuit community in Kugluktuk then successfully solidified into a story of transformation and hope. The Grizzlies is a narrative that justifies the poignancy of their journey from the freezing white expanse of the Arctic to the Toronto-based National Lacrosse Championships. <clears throat> 16 years ago, ESPN managed to run a brief segment featuring the Grizzlies on SportsCenter, which caught the attention of Jake Steinfield, founder of Major League Lacrosse. He was so touched with, by the tale that he decided to get in touch with the teacher. The ripple effect that caused the wave. The original Grizzlies later assembled at a lacrosse event in Denver at Steinfeld's request, which then led to another one as he worked his desire to present their story across a bigger lens to a bigger audience. Miranda de Pensier confirmed the existence of a real character behind almost every important role an incident filling up the movie. There is a character struggling against a terrifyingly inhuman father, a young woman subjected to relationship abuse and a teen who's compelled to hunt for scraps of food to support his helpless and hungry young br brother. Russ Shepard is played by Ben Schnetz Schnetzer, known for his ability to fully inhabit the essence of every character he takes up. Most of the scenes in the movie were shot in the Nian Kungut and Iqaluit picturesque places of the Arctic itself. According to De Pensier, the entire process was difficult on every level imaginable, but the creators insisting on bringing out a wholesome indigenous experience. Eventually, the percentage of Inuit and Indigenous people rounded up to 91% of the cast and 33% of the crew. Russ Shepard has taken on a job as a history teacher in Kugluktuk High School to pay off his college debt to the, the Canadian government. Located in the Arctic or the end of the world, as his colleague Mike calls it, the remote town has the highest suicide rate in North America. 
the oppressive sense of misery hits the wide-eyed new resident instantly on his introductory drive through the town. He sees buildings in disrepair, a tiny police station, a tough and tough relentless teen smoking and drinking. Russ's plan is to do his civic duty and then move on to teaching at a prep school in a more industrious area. But for now, he's excited to inspire his very first crop of students. Naturally, they aren't going to make it easy for him, being that Russ is a white man in a primary, in primary intuit community that's inherently distrusting of his kind. The students are naturally skeptical when Russ Shepard, yet another ignorant and unprepared white rookie teacher, arrives from the South on a one-year teaching contract as a history teacher. With much to learn, but deeply shaken by the death of one of his students, Russ introduces his class, class to the sport of lacrosse in an effort to help lift the dangerous fog of trauma existing in his students. While initially resistant, the students gradually come together to embrace the sport and form Team Grizzlies to find inspiration and to make shifts in their own lives. Together with Russ, the team gains support of a deeply divided town and eventually negotiates its way to the National Lacrosse Championships. The first day of school ends with many absentees, miscommunications due to cultural misunderstanding and a fist fight with a combative student, Zach. Russ's complaints to the principal, Janice, are heard, but she's reticent to interfere since the struggles are a result of their culture putting family first and unnecessary education last. With most of the class stuck in, the, in toxic relationships, some romantic, some family, they are set up for failure. That is, until Russ gets the bright idea to form the lacrosse team. He firmly believes that if the kids have an outlet to channel their frustrations, it could transform their lives and those around them. Convincing the teens and their parents is no easy task, but they inevitably, inevitably begin training with hopes to play in the lacrosse nationals in Toronto. While the film is stamped with an R rating for the Motion Picture Association, as it deals with suicide, trauma, <clears throat> and domestic abuse, it doesn't seem entirely justified. Soft peddling those facets would be a detriment to the narrative and to the characters of real life tale. It would sacrifice authenticity if these things weren't captured and discussed in a realistic way. Despite the serious overtones, there are small moments of levity interspersed. From Russ's eye-opening trip to the town's co-op, to the helpful townsperson not understanding the point of jogging, to the fake out filmmaking artistry of a deflective goal and the, ga the gags provided necessary, these, sorry, these gags provide necessary tension release. The Grizzlies is more than a usual triumph through sports movie. It is a true story about a group of Inuit students who changed their teacher and eventually changed their whole community for the better. For the town that held one of the highest teen suicide rates in North America before the Grizzlies program took hold, where 50% of the kids never attended high school, where just graduating from high school was a huge accomplishment. These kids are extraordinary ambassadors for what is possible when you join together. Though it could be considered a sports movie, the drama at the center of the piece transcends genre. 
The result is a feature film experience that at once a vivid celebration of the Inuit life and culture, an elegy to the traumatic impact of European colonization and Inuit peoples, the ode to the resilience of the youth who found their power by facing deeply rooted fear, fears and vulnerabilities with grit and grace. The characters in the Grizzlies represent every kid across North America who is struggling with structurally imposed barriers and intergenerational trauma and shows there's always a way to stay in the game and overcome obstacles and gain confidence despite overwhelming odds. It is scary to think what if the Grizzlies had never started at what it might have meant for the community. Supporting characters earn their time in the spotlight. Their conflict is motivated through easily understandable internal and external stakes without any gooey, overly saccharine manipulation. Absentee Adam and Zach are connected through their family constraints as main providers. The once shy Miranda once, and once iconic Kyle, whose outer shells barely conceal hurt, stress and anguish blossom into thoughtful, well-spoken young adults. These characters also parallel each other as their home lives are both marked by abuse. Kyle in particular gives a vulnerable performance filled with intense empathy, shedding masculine bravado in favor of a polished sense of ten tenderness. The cinematographer and director bring artistic panache to the local audiences that local audiences don't often see. The gray, the gray overcast skies provide a good sense of mood, instilling this portrait with a crisp, somber shading. There's an electricity in the training monologue, utilizing wide shots of the team in the harsh snow, choreographed in sync with the driving drums and chants of the soundtrack. They also echo Rocky II's charming chicken chase sequence as the team races against Maggie the dog. Perhaps the most profound and poignant part of the feature is in the end credits, where the filmmaker pull where are they now with the real members of the Grizzlies. Their epilogues showcasing how the lessons of lacrosse radiated throughout their lives as activists and members of their tribe are moving. It is a testament to the powerful impact sports programs can have, not just on the life of one person, but the life on the, of the community as a whole. Miranda is currently the career development officer for the government of Nunavut. Kyle is living in Yellowknife while working on a diamond mine. Adam is the assistant recreation coordinator for the town of Kugluktuk. Winter, who is the girl that goes by the name of Spring, is the coordinator of executive training for Inuit Tepriit Kan Kanatami. I don't speak Inuit. And Vinny works for the government of Nunavut. Grandma. Grandma has to be the defining moment of the movie. At first, when Russ arrived at her igloo in a snowmobile, she chastised him for scaring the seals away. However, at the town meeting, she was the stalwart in change. She was reluctant to accept the snowmobile in the beginning, but then realized it would be a help to them. At the meeting, she made an impassioned plea for the funds for the lacrosse team, going back to her statement that the people must accept change. A geography lesson. Kuglutuk, on the edge of the Arctic Circle, there is nothing nearby. There is nothing to do. A perfect place to get lost and become invisible. 
a stop on the Northwest Passage in the middle of nowhere. Kugluk took the place of moving water, formerly copper mine until the 1st of January, 1996, is a hamlet located at the mouth of the Copper Mine River in the Kik Kikitimiut region of Nunavut in Canada on the Coronation Gulf southwest of Victoria Island. It is westernmost community of Nunavut near the border of the Northwest Territories. The community has the usual services, a post office, a northern store, a co-op, and the Hunters and Trappers Association. The two schools in the area are the Kugluk Tuk High School and the Jimmy Hickok Ilyavik High School. There is no Chabad. <clears throat> There's no Chabad in the state of Nunavut or the Northwest Territories. The closest would be in Alberta or Manitoba. The surrounding landscape <clears throat> is dominated by the rocky and often barren Canadian shield. The region has a subarctic climate, but barely so, with July having an average temperature of 51 degrees. It has very cold and extremely dry winters, light snowfall. Though trees do exist in the region, they are dwarfed by the <clears throat> extreme, extremely sparse um, uh, landscape. Plant growth in the region during the summer includes small shrubs, grass, moss, blueberries, blackberries, cranberries, and various flowers, and dwarf willow and birch trees. The highest temperature ever recorded in Kuglutuk was 98 degrees on the 15th of July, 1989. And the coldest temperature was minus 58 on the 2nd of February, 1968. Kuglutuk was incorporated as a hamlet in 1981 with a pop population of 1,491 people. The hamlet changed its name in 1996 to Kugluktuk, which means the place of rapids, referring to the rapids at Bloody Falls, 15 miles upstream. Though the film bears similarities to Lean on Me, Stand and Deliver, and Dangerous Minds, it hits the conventional tonal, tonal notes of most sports movies. It holds its own creativity creatively and cultural specificity, as well as drawn emotionally evocative characters. Russ, whose real life counterpart earns a cameo as a referee and serves as the film's lacrosse consultant and his fish out of water qualities provide the conduit for the story's educational aspects. These revolve around the town's folks traumatic backstory and their long standing distrust of the white people who abused them and forced them to assimilate. In order to keep the proceedings from collapsing to a white savior narrative, the screen screenwriters make the story less about a white man saving the natives and more about sports enriching and healing a community. Lacrosse. Lacrosse is a team sport played with a lacrosse stick and a lacrosse ball. It is the oldest organized sport in North America with its origins in a tribal game played by the indigenous peoples of the Eastern Woodlands and by various other indigenous people of North America. Lacrosse and not ice hockey is the national sport of Canada. The game was extensively modified reducing the violence by European colonizers to create its current collegiate and provisional form. Lacrosse is based on games played by the various native communities as early as 1100 AD. By the 17th century, a version of lacrosse was well established and documented by the Jesuit missionary priests in the, in the territory of President, President present day Canada. 
in the traditional Aboriginal Canadian version, each team consisted of about 100 to 1,000 men on a field to up to 40 miles long. These games lasted from sunup to sundown for two to three weeks straight and were played as part of a ceremonial ritual, a kind of symbolic warfare, or to give thanks to the creator or the master. What a civilized way to settle conflicts and disputes. Lacrosse played a significant role in the community and religious life of tribes across the continent for many years. Early lacrosse was characterized by deep spiritual involvement befitting the spirit of combat in which it was undertaken. Those who took part did so in the role of warriors and the goal of bringing the glory and honor to themselves and their tribe. The game was said to be played for the creator and referred to as the creator's game. Ben Schnetzer, born Jewish, as Russ Shepard, is an American actor. He is the son of actors Stephen Schnetzel and Nancy Schneider. Schnetzer was born and raised in New York City. He is a graduate of the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. In 2010, Schnetzer appeared in an episode of Law and Order and co-starred on the series Happy Town. He played Max Vandenberg in the film and adaption of The Book Thief in 2013. Although the movie was widely panned, Schnetz's performance as Max, a Jew being hidden from, by a family of Hitler's sympathizers, was praised. In 2014, Schnetz was cast in the LGBT comedy Pride. In 2015, it was announced that Schnetzer would appear in the Oliver Stonehelm feature Snowden about the whistleblower Edward Snowden. Jewish enough for me. So what makes the Grizzlies a Jewish film? I need to quantify this in order to get my grant from Smiling Senior. The, the executive producer is Jake Steinfeld, Jewish. The Grizzlies was number one at the Canadian box office for five weeks. Jake Steinfeld, born February the 21st, 1958 in Brooklyn, dropped out of SUNY Cortland to move to Los Angeles. Steinfeld developed brands and is CEO of Body by Jake, also cre created Fit TV and then launched Exercise TV. He also founded Major League Lacrosse, the first pro outdoor lacrosse league in 2001. Also founded the World Series of Lacrosse, which features teams from the US, Canada, Europe, Israel, and other nations. He was a personal trainer to Steven Spielberg and Harrison Ford for the Indiana Jones series. He went on to do various sitcoms such as King of the Hill, Dream On, shaping up and more. His film career included America Americathon and he had the lead role in Home Sweet Home. Also did Cheech and Chong's next movie, Into the Night and the Disney animated Ratatouille. Jake Steinfeld was one huge guy. I was unaware that Jewish men looked like this. And the movie, The Grizzlies is about helping and saving a people. Whether it be guns or drugs, these problems must be tackled. In this town, one man tackled the drug and suicide problem and won. We can do it if we want to. We should do it because we must. Tikkun olam, Jewish enough for me. So overall, it's a Jewish movie for me. And I'm now going to open the floor. Thank you. You can unmute your microphones and open for discussion. Hello? Were the family lives 
based on actual stories or just made up? I believe that it was it was two stories. <laughs> I believe it was two two stories. All the um, all the cast uh, or ninety why ninety one percent of the cast was all Inuit from the Inuit community. So they 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 tried to keep the authenticity of everything. So so that that's it. It's it's actually quite amazing with um, being a teacher of what you have to go through. It was quite amazing for me to see how ill-prepared Russ was when he arrived um, in Kugluktuk. Um, when Miranda went to, when he did roll call um, and no one answered and Miranda came to him and said, we don't answer by saying yes or putting up our hands. Um, we blink our eyelids. And uh, so it's important to me that we take note of the people we're trying to teach and how we teach them. <laughs> I have a couple of comments about things that didn't ring true to me. You have a family starving to death, yet everybody in the, in the movie was well-dressed and there was plenty of, mo of money for liquor. So I had a difficulty uh, dealing with that. That's why they were starving. They spent their money illogically. Or uh, not logically. Well, um, I think that alcohol and drugs play too much of a role, particularly in the lower income areas. Right. Um, uh, I'm not from Canada, but I have a friend from Canada who explained a lot of things mm -hmm. about um, the Inuits and about the tribes and how they have ignored by the Canadian government it's only lately that the Canadian government has um, uh, opened their eyes to their communities and done something about it. But the most about amazing... about ten. May I speak? Is it a... all right? About ten years ago, Herb and I uh, took a drive uh, as far as we could go north, and when we couldn't go by car anymore. We took what was called the Polar Bear Express, which is a, a train that took us as far as the train would go. After that, you couldn't go anywhere except by plane or by foot or by uh, some kind of water uh, route. And we um, met a number of Inuits. It was an Inuit community there. And they were selling uh, sculpt little sculptures they'd made and so on. And we spoke to, um, we took a little plane ride up uh, to the... Um, um, I forget where, but anyway, we, uh, the guy who, who took us was the son of the, um, of the uh, minister who was up there, and he was an Inuit, he actually, uh, uh, he was, his mother was, was Inuit, his father, the, the, the uh, minister was white, and uh, he, was, he talked to us quite a bit, and they told us that, just what you said, Izzy, that um, the, they had a, a, a they had a, a simple life, a, a, a just, a, you know, a, the Inuits years ago, they knew how to hunt, they knew how to fish, they knew how to build their, their igloos, whatever they lived in. And um, the education they got was passed down from uh, one generation to the other, and they knew how to exist. Then all of a sudden the government came in and they decided they should get an education. And they decided, they brought in all these things like television sets and, um, and the people began to spend money uh, on things they didn't need, and the children no longer got, uh, no longer were taught the life-preserving things that they that they knew just from their generations before. But and then and this just deteriorated. And what you're saying is yes. Then all of a sudden the Canadian government realized what had happened, and they began to take an interest. But um, it was a slow deterioration of a very um, 
a very primitive kind of community that was functioning and that just got off track because of modernization, which they couldn't use properly. So do you remember the first scene when he arrives there and he's in the airplane and he's sitting next to that Eskimo and he says, do you come from here? And your guy just said, yes. He says, have you lived here long? He said, yes, 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. It's, it's, um, um, it's, it's, it's a point where Western society is trying to impose Western standards onto indigenous native people. Right. And it doesn't work. Is it? Right. You don't have to yeah. look at Canada. Exactly. You just look at our native here in this country, the native population here, and what, exactly. what we did to the natives yeah. of this country. I'll tell you something. I tell you something that bothers me, Izzy. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, being a teacher, and also you know coming from New York City to where we are living now, which is a complete cultural change, it really, really bothered me that they would take this young man and dump him in the middle of nowhere with no education as to what he was landing in. Mm -hmm. And it really, it, 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 it got me so angry that he had no preparation ahead of time as to what he was walking into, how to expect, what was accepted, what was not accepted, just jump him right in. And the, the suicide rate among, he should have known before he even went into, and I, I have to say this, I left, after the second suicide. I left after the, the, the second suicide because I just, I could not sit there and take it. Because how can you do that to the natives, to the Inuit people, and to this young guy? I mean, that's not fair. I like, I like to piggyback on that. Is, is your name Betty? I'm Janet. Betty? Yeah. Okay, so I too, I'm from, um, originally from Brooklyn, New York. And when I barely, barely turned 21, I was teaching in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Ah, um, yeah. okay. Uh -huh. okay, so that was back in, so I'll give my age, that was back in, in 1968. And um, we, you know, as young people, we were bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and I was gonna solve the, the all the problems of, of, of the world there and my and I still lived at home and my parents would say what you walked you walked up because the the kid didn't show up in school you walked up the the urine filled um walk up <laughs> steps and in you know and you did this and you did you know kind of thing so you know you're gonna solve the world when you're you when mm -hmm. you're when you're young like that. So, I, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I, I, the other thing that I wanted to say was um, talking um, about the movie and, and the theme of um, being the underdog and, and you know, uh, togetherness. Did it remind anyone of the other movie, um, Hoosiers, the basketball <laughs> movie? Right. right. Wasn't right. that so much like that, where they, you know, he took him to the to the to the big tournament, and he said, "Okay, measure the uh, uh, how high is the is the hoop? Oh, it's the same as ours. How you know that kind of thing." So that's all that I wanted to um, say, and I'll put myself. You know, you, you've had the... you've had sports <laughs> movies about the same thing. You can see it in ice hockey. You can see it in figure skating. You can see it in the the Jamaican bobsled team that went to the Olympics. <clears throat> That's a perfect so, example of- And, and the best, the and very, it, very best teachers, the very best teachers are the PE teachers, are the coaches. They are the best teachers. It, it, not necessarily the academics because they know how to, 
They know how to get to the reach people. the kids. Reach they the kids. They know how. To, they know how to do it. Yep. Biddy. I put Biddy. myself on mute and listened for a few minutes more. It's Biddy. It's um, <laughs> when you mentioned that um, Russ was dumped in the Arctic Circle. Uh, from my research was uh, he obviously graduated uh, with his degree and he had to repay the Canadian government for his loans. And the right. part of the repayment was mm -hmm. to work all year. And from what I read, this was the only job available. And that's how he got there. It was, yes, he might have been unprepared. And I think that he had maybe four or five days warning before being shipped out there to, to go there. So just in his defense a little bit, um, it was, I believe, the only job available. Does anybody remember there was a TV series called Northern Exposure? Right. Mm -hmm. right. Doctor from New York. Yeah. And a, it seemed to me he was a Jewish doctor. Yes. And shipped right. to a small town in Alaska. And right. what, he, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, what he, that entailed. But there's also a book, it's called Bear Town, and it's about ice hockey and the team and what that does right. for the town. So that was also the dynamics of, of the, um, and the, uh, there's a hierarchy, the coaches, the managers, and what it does in the town. It, it's, um, it was also interesting. I, uh, I just want to put a, put a word in, yeah. but nothing to do with the movie. Mm -hmm. In Australia, if you immigrate, you're a doctor, a teacher, or even if you graduate in Australia, they send you to the outback first. So you've got to struggle in the outback. Okay, yeah. go, Rosalind. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I don't know about now, but I know when I graduated uh, New York City, it's not unusual as a teacher to send the new teachers to the most right. difficult right. areas. First of all, that's where the jobs were. That's mm -hmm. where the teachers who had uh, seniority, a tenure, whatever, could get out of and get into the better, the better schools. So the, that's where the positions were. And that's where they send. That was very, uh, I mean, this was, wasn't quite as bad as the situation in this, the movie, but still it was very difficult for a, a, a brand new untrained teacher to go into some of the most difficult areas in the city. And this is what happened. And it still happens today. Yeah. My granddaughter mm -hmm. graduated and uh, she got a job here in Arizona in a terrible area. And she was a PE teacher with no facility, no gymnasium. If it was too hot, they put them in a double classroom with a cement floor. What are you going to do with two, cla with two uh, classes and a cement floor and it's 110 degrees with no air conditioning in a room? So they're doing the same. It still is today. Ellen? Ellen, when oh, I yeah. was about when I was about Russ's age, I went to the Pacific to teach indigenous students as a Peace Corps volunteer. But I was given three months training by our government on the language, the culture, and everything else I would have to know about the island and the indigenous people that I was going to be teaching, which of course made a big difference. And what did you teach? I taught high school business education. And they knew English? Yes, because there were, it was an area of islands about 3000 miles across the Pacific called Micronesia. And there were nine verbal languages, oral languages. So people from different islands would be in the classroom and the only common language they had was English. But they were interested in learning. These the students you taught were interested in learning. The Most students, of them. The students. Not all of them. Yeah. The, the, well, the students in the movie had no, no interest whatsoever. 
but my students had it a lot easier because there were white sand beaches, swaying palm trees, <laughs> uh, no snow or ice or wind. The life was a lot easier for right. them. You know, this is not just true in teaching. This is true when our government goes into places where they send people in who really don't know the language, don't know the culture, and they're supposed to be an, an ambassador to that country. I mean, you know, we, we got into Afghanistan, we got into Iraq without any knowledge of what the, the country was about, just figuring that what we did was going to be right, period. Uh oh, we're not going to solve the problems of the world. <laughs> I have to tell you that we had a weatherman here that would say, if you think it's cold, I'm going to tell you what the temperature is in Nunavut. Yeah. <laughs> so that, we always knew what the weather was in Nunavut. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm really, I'm really happy that the movie has um, a little bit of a different twist. And uh, um, as I said in the end, for me, the Jewish part of it was the Tikkun Olam, where yeah. you see he saved the town mm -hmm. and, and saved the people. And at the end of the movie, where they spotlighted, where are they now? Uh, yeah. Which is only 10 years after. That mm -hmm. was quite an amazing feat. And also, Russ remained in... Mm -hmm. seven years. So he obviously became attached to it uh, mm -hmm. in, in some way or another. So and the other it, teacher's still there, right? The other one, I don't know today. Or, uh, I mean, he was, they said he was he still was teaching. Before, yeah. yeah. The other guy was running away from something. Uh, right. He was an alcoholic, I think. Correct. I mean, if you want to make yourself disappear, then good look took the place. <laughs> so, so yeah. and, and, and I always say, if, you, if a place is remote, you check it out by the Chabad house. If there's no Chabad, very remote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I was doing work, we were doing